You're listening to Scaling Up Services, where we speak with entrepreneurs, authors, business experts, and thought leaders to give you the knowledge and insights you need to scale your service-based business faster and easier. And now, here is your host, business coach, Bruce Eckfeld. Are you a CEO looking to scale your company faster and easier? Check out Thrive Roundtable. Thrive combines a moderated peer group mastermind, expert one-on-one coaching, access to proven growth tools, and a 24-7 support community. Created by Inc. award-winning CEO and certified scaling up business coach, Bruce Eckfeldt, Thrive will help you grow your business more quickly and with less drama. For details on the program, visit Eckfeldt.com slash Thrive. That's E-C-K-F-E-L-D-T dot com slash Thrive. Welcome, everyone. This is Scaling Up Services. I'm Bruce Eckfeldt. I'm your host. And our guest today is Nir Eyal, and he is author of Indistractable, How to Control Your Attention and Choose Your Life. He's also author of Hooked, How to Build Habit-Forming Products. We're going to talk a little bit about both of those. Uh, Excited about this. I think one of the key things that leaders in service-based businesses need to do is figure out how to create more focus, how do you create more attention into the things that are really generating value, not only for them, but for their businesses. So with that, Nir, welcome to the program. Thanks so much. Great to be here. So why don't we talk a little bit about you and your background first, and then we can talk about the books and we can talk about some of the takeaways. How did you get into this? What was your passion that got you into writing and choosing these topics? Tell us the story. Yeah, so I write when I can't find a book that addresses the topic <laughs> I'm looking to learn about. I mean, I, I don't write, I'm not one of these authors that writes because they have the answer. I write because I need to know the answer. And so it. the way I find the answer is by writing these books. I, I don't like writing books for answers that people already have to tough problems. That's silly, Right. So I like it. Yeah. Most, most of the time when I when I uh, have a problem in my life, I'll, I'll read what others have written about the particular dilemma. And if uh, they've written an answer that that satisfies me, well, then I'm done. Right? I don't need to, <laughs> the task to write is that book. Yeah. yeah, exactly. And yeah. that happens most of the time. But every once in a while, so every five years or so, I come across a, a problem in my life that I haven't found uh, a satisfactory answer to. And so this happened back in 2012. I had just come off the acquisition of my last company. And I had this hypothesis that the future of technological innovation when it comes to SaaS businesses as well mm-hmm. as, as consumer web type products would really necessitate an understanding of habits. That I could see that as the interface was shrinking from desktops to laptops to mobile devices to wearable devices, and now you know with the Amazon Alexa and uh, yeah. these type devices, there is no visual interface anymore. I could see that that habits would become increasingly important. Meaning, if your customer doesn't realize that your product is there, like, you know, if they don't have this habit in their mind to remind them to use the product, well, then it might as well not even exist. Because the fact is that we, that there isn't the real estate yeah. uh, that we previously had to trigger people. These are called external triggers, you know, all the, the things in our environment that cue us to action. Those were disappearing as the interface shrank. And so I was looking for a book, okay, if habits were going to become increasingly important, how do you build habit-forming products? And I couldn't find a book on how to do that. So I decided to do some research, which eventually led to the book. Uh, and then I, I taught for many years at Stanford at the design school, at the business school there as well. And uh, that led to my first book, Hooked, How to Build Habit-Forming Products. And the same thing happened with uh, with my second book, with Indistractable. Yeah. I found that you know some of these products that I understood very intimately in terms of how they're designed to become habit-forming, some of them I use too much, and I would get distracted. I mean, yeah. th- th- it's such a it's funny because uh, you know when I wrote Hooked, I had to convince people. You know, I'd, I'd attend these workshops with VCs and startups, and I'd convince them, no, you don't understand that, that these companies like Facebook and Twitter and Instagram and Slack they're using consumer psychology to make their products engaging. And believe it or not, the sentiment was, yeah, no, nah, I don't know. They, they just seemed like, you know, if Zuckerberg got lucky, you know, <laughs> the Twitter guys just got lucky. Yeah. And, and it turns out that that's not the case, right? That they, these folks really understand what makes you click and what makes you tick better than you understand yourself. Yeah. And understanding consumer psychology is a huge competitive advantage in, in all businesses. And so that's really what I wanted to do was to take the lessons from these companies like Facebook, like the gaming companies, like YouTube, and so that everyone can understand in business how to build the kind of products that are just as sticky as some of these uh, consumer web products so that you can keep customers coming back and using your product, not because they feel like they have to, but because they want to, yeah. right? How great would it well, be? And that's a, this is kind of this question of, you know, is this nefarious or is this, you know, altruistic in terms well, of how, how you use these superpowers? For your purposes and for 
for everyone listening, you know, nobody is getting addicted to SaaS software. Come on. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> right? no, it wouldn't it be great if people got hooked to an exercise app or to a personal productivity service yeah. or to, you know, some kind of enterprise software. I mean, most enterprise software out there sucks. It's horrible. Oh, yes. No, <laughs> they so do, it does think, everything possible to make you not want to use it, exactly. but yet you're compelled for business reasons. So that's my audience, right? So I took the lessons of the gaming companies, of the companies that people think are big time wasters, and thought to myself, well, it's the same exact psychology. We can use that same psychology to make all kinds of things more engaging. And that's really the mission that, that I'm on. Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, there's this idea that, I mean, the, the application and the, the interface designers, the product designers can use these things to kind of influence the way you interact with them and, and sort of create more value and make it more intuitive. You know, but there's also this element of, you know, how are you doing that to yourself and, and using these tools to actually encourage be, long-term behaviors or, or encourage your behaviors that are going to get you long-term outcomes that you're looking for that may be difficult to implement in the short term because they're just not pleasant or they're not something that uh, you'd want to do if we can make them more kind of habit forming, you know, to get those longer term kind of benefits that you're looking for is, is fascinating. Right. So let's talk about the sort of the the distraction side, you know, making in dis- making making yourself indistractable. I mean, I guess why why is that important first of all? Like why does distraction end up becoming an issue for people uh, in terms of, you know, their day-to-day lives? Yeah, well, I mean, just just look around, right? <laughs> uh, it's funny that we we you know we live in a time when products are made to be so good, so engaging that sometimes we overuse them and whether that's at, you know at home or you know outside of work whether it's using Instagram too much or watching too many Netflix uh, movies or shows or whatever it might be you know that there's distraction all around us and then in particular when it comes to the workplace environment I mean for God's sakes we are just drowning in distraction whether it's open floor plan offices whether oh it's gosh, yeah. slack channels whether it's email whether it's meetings I mean all of these things can be such huge distractions from what we really want to do so it's important first of all to, to define what I mean by distraction you know words are really really important yeah. so the opposite of distraction is not focus the opposite of distraction is traction so both words come from the same latin root trahare which means to pull mm-hmm. and they both end in the same six letter word a c t i o n that spells action so traction is any action that pulls you towards what you want to do in life things that you do with intent Got and it. the opposite of traction is dis traction, anything that pulls you away from what you want to do, things that you are not doing with intent. So this is particularly important in the modern workforce where we let distraction trick us all day long, mm-hmm. right? I would yeah. sit down at my desk and I say, okay, now I'm going to do that writing I've been putting off. Now I'm going to finish that presentation. Now I'm going to finish that report, whatever it might be, right after I check my email. <laughs> You know, day yeah. after day, how many of us do this? And and it's it's horrible because we are lying to ourselves. You know, we say that, you know, honesty is such a virtue for most people. Uh, you would never lie to our friends. We'd never lie to our family. We'd never lie to our employer. And yet we mm. lie to ourselves every day. We mm. say we're going to work out. We don't. We mm. say we're going to hang out with our friends and, and, you know, get together with people we love. We don't. We're not fully present with them. We're checking our phones. We say we're going to do that hard project that needs us to do focused work. We don't. We keep procrastinating day after day. Why? Why don't we do the things we ourselves know we should do? And so that's really what the book is about. It's not just about tech distraction. It's about the nature and the psychology of all distraction. Yeah, I like that. And I like the idea that it's almost like a double negative here. It's like indistractable. It could, you could just call it tractable. <laughs> <laughs> tractable. <laughs> because that's what we're, I mean, really we're talking about, you know, how to, how, to get, how to get to the traction that you really want and avoid the things that are removing you from that or, or getting interrupting that ability to get traction on the, on the goals and the, the progress yeah. that you want to see. And to be very clear, I'm not here to tell anybody what their values should be, right? What I want people to do is to turn their values into time. Whatever it is that you think is important to you that's based on your values, I want to help you do. And I don't, you know, if you want time in your day to meditate, to pray, to paint, whatever it is you want to do with your time, yeah. that's your business. Don't let anyone tell you that, you know, going on social media is somehow morally inferior to, I don't know, watching football on TV. There's no mm-hmm. difference. Mm-hmm. There's no difference. It's whatever you want to do with intent is what you should do. But I want to help people do the things they know they want to do and somehow don't do. Uh, because it. in this day and age, you know, the, the, the fact is distraction is nothing new. I talk about in the book how Plato talked about akrasia, the tendency to do things against our better interest. He was literally complaining about how distracting the world was 2,500 years ago. So this is not a new problem. Yeah. Uh, you know, distraction has been around a very, very long time. And we love to, you know, talk about motivated reasoning. We love to blame our technology. We love to say <laughs> oh, Slack absolutely. is doing oh, it. Email absolutely. is doing it. My iPhone, everything's doing it's, it to it's me. It's everything else. Everything, everything else is, else. yeah. And it's yeah. not true. 
true. Those are what's called proximate causes, not the root cause of yeah. the problem. Yeah. So I like, and I like that idea that it's not, this is not about a value or a judgment. It's really about sort of this integrity of, are you doing things you really want to do? And if you're not, and if you're not doing the things you really want to do, then you're in, you're in a distracted state. Like you're, you're engaging, you're spending time, energy, focus on something that is really not at the kind of in your heart of hearts, the thing that you really want to make progress on. It's, it's something that is taking you off that path. Um, That's right. Yeah. And, and so, so why is that? So I guess psychologically, why do we get distracted? Is this the, our, our lizard brain that's looking out for lions jumping out at us and from the bush or something. I mean, what's the what's the underlying psychology that causes us to actually be distracted in the first place? Yeah, so the underlying psychology, the root cause of the problem is a misunderstanding of human motivation. That if you ask most people what motivates us, uh, not just what motivates us to get distracted, what motivates everything we do. Let's really start from first principles here. What what causes people to do what they do every day? And most people will give you some version of carrots and sticks, right? That everything this is called Freud's pleasure principle that everything we do is about the pursuit of pleasure and the avoidance of pain. Mm -hmm. Not true. Neurologically speaking, that is not what is going on at all. What is happening, in fact, is all pain. Everything we do every single day, every action, every behavior is motivated by one thing, and that is the desire to escape discomfort. Yeah, It's pain all the way down. This is called the homeostatic response. That uh, when we, we know this to be true physically, right, if you feel cold, you put on a jacket. If you're hot, you take it off. If you feel hunger pangs, you eat. Mm-hmm. When you eat too much, oh, that doesn't feel good, you stop eating. So, of course, we see this happening every day with our bodies. It happens, of course, with our brains. That when you feel lonely, check Facebook. Yeah. When you're uncertain, you Google. When you're bored, well, you check stock prices, sports scores, the news, Pinterest, uh, uh, Reddit. All of these products and services fundamentally cater to these uncomfortable human sensations. And so that means, so here's the big insight. That means if all behavior is a desire to escape discomfort, that therefore must mean that time management is pain management. And we don't talk about this enough. We Ah, talk about the tactics. We talk about, okay, here's how to shave off five minutes and become more efficient. Here's how to do this, you know, life hack. Here's what this latest guru says. Get up every morning and shower at 3 a.m., whatever. Silly. If we don't think about the real cause of why we do everything we do, which is to escape discomfort, we miss the point. The point is that everything we do is about a desire to escape pain. And so we cannot manage our time unless we manage that pain. Yeah, that's good. I I was worried you were going to tell us we all need to be masochist and just start to love the pain and then we'll be more productive. (laughs) Well, you know, funny enough, (laughs) it's not about about necessarily loving the pain, although that is a huge competitive advantage. I mean, if you can become the kind of person, we see them every day, right? You know, that car buff that just loves working on their car. To me, my God, I I can't stand that stuff. I, you know, I gladly pay a mechanic to to fix, uh, you know, to repair my car. You know, the barista who is obsessed with getting that cup of coffee Perfect. Just perfect. Yeah. Or the 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 person who uh, you know the 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 person who makes quilts or what you know crafts and they just love you know working on that project. It's, it seems masochistic in a way, but that's in fact if you can do that, if you can learn to just love the discomfort or at least reimagine the discomfort, that is actually a huge competitive advantage. And that is one of the three techniques I talk about in the book around what's called reimagining the task, yeah. uh, seeing it differently. And there are some techniques. Now, this is not extrinsic motivation. Some people say, well, do what Mary Poppins said. Pull, put a spoonful yeah. of sugar on stuff doesn't work. That's an extrinsic motivator and yeah. actually has been shown to backfire. What you have to do is to learn to see the task differently. And there's some techniques there that allow you to do that. It's interesting because I think it's one thing that I picked up from sports, you know, at a young age, just doing, you know, ex- extended distance kind of work and triathlons and Ironman and stuff like that was just you develop a muscle for reframing the physical pain and being able to push through on those things it is certainly a competitive advantage. I mean, it's knowing that you can do something like that gives yeah. you a huge ability to undertake new tasks that that may be a quite painful for a while, but knowing you can push through and knowing you can get to the other side is absolutely, is powerful. absolutely. And and people can do it. Like if people can can enjoy. I mean, think of something that you know you really don't like doing, and you'll probably find someone who has learned to like that work. And that's, <laughs> there, I think that's people, the interesting. How does that happen? Yeah, there's, there's nothing the inherently thing. you know objective about something being uh, you know uh, unlovable. It's completely yeah. subjective. It's in our heads. Well, yeah. we can learn to actually like those they're maybe not like those things but make them suck less right yeah well even something like you know going on stage you know it's like you know for some people it can be crippling like the 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 the, the feeling the anxiety that the physical sensation of getting ready to go 
go on stage in front of a big audience for one person can be debilitating. Another person, it's energizing. It's it's like a it it, it gets them going and and drives them t- to the performance. It's the exact same physiological you know, things that they're going through. It's just how they frame it and how they kind of respond to it from kind of an emotional and a a frame point of view can be quite different. Yeah, that's exactly right. So that's one of the three techniques for how we we, uh, master these internal triggers. We can also reimagine the trigger itself. We can also reimagine our temperament. And that's probably out of the three, uh, probably the most important. And what I mean by temperament, you know, temperament is defined as the underlying traits of a a person or an animal. You know, it's the way of being. And it turns out that we carry around with us so many of these self-limiting beliefs around who we are, our temperament. Mm. One of the most pervasive myths that I really wanted to uh, debunk is this idea that willpower is a limited resource. And we've heard this in some form or another many, many times. The psychological name for this is ego depletion. Okay. And there were actually studies that, that found that people run out of willpower like they run out of gas in a gas tank, right? We, we've seen this in some form or another. You come, I used to come home from work every day. Oh, yeah. So and, this is that, like at the end of the day, like your physical yeah. exhaustion, be, being yeah. physically tired ends up taking away your willpower, your, your ability to push through. Yes. Yeah, you, you run out of it. So you say, mm-hmm. oh, I'm spent. You know, I yeah. deserve, I have no more willpower left. I, how can I say no to that Ben and Jerry's and watching some Netflix on the couch? Yeah. And they actually show, you know, when people do a hard task that they run out of willpower. They can't keep denying themselves something. Mm-hmm. Unfortunately, the studies that got a lot of press uh, could not replicate. Part of this uh, we see in social psychology, this huge replication crisis with yeah. many phenomenon that you might, you might have been following lately. Mm-hmm. Uh, and this is one of the things that uh, could not replicate, except except the work of Carol Dweck found over at Stanford. She did a study that found that there is such a thing as ego depletion, but only for one group of people. That the only people who do actually run out of willpower, just like you might run out of gas in a gas tank, the yeah. only people are people who believe <laughs> that willpower is a limited resource. <laughs> Okay? okay, so this is so important. This is so important yes. because this self-limiting belief of, oh, you see, I'm spent is completely in our heads, as is the belief that technology is hijacking our brains, yeah, yeah, that it's yeah. manipulating all of us, that we're all becoming addicted to oh it, that it's gosh. irresistible. It's nonsense. And yet spreading it is making it too oh, true. I was just going to say, and that's the tragedy of this, is that actually the, the, the reporting on the research or reporting research that says it's limiting actually causes it to be so. That's that's exactly right. And yeah. of course, you know, the media loves this because the media is in the same exact business as Facebook. Yeah. They're all attention merchants. They all yeah. make money the same way. Facebook makes money the same way as the New York Times. They sell your attention. Yeah. And there's nothing wrong with that business model. What I think is funny is when the pot calls the kettle black and we have all this criticism towards these tech companies when they're in the exact same business model to suck up as much as of your time. Yeah. And so if you want to be on Facebook, go for it. If you want to read the New York Times, go for it. But let's not trick ourselves here. They're both monetizing your time and attention. And if you you do if you use them with intent they're wonderful it's when we use them without intent when we use them as not traction but distraction that's the problem mm, interesting um so tell us so so what are the three again so it's the um give, give us the three components that you came up for, with. for mastering the internal yes, triggers yes okay so the mastering internal triggers is step one of four and in step one there's three sub steps and those steps are reimagine your triggers reimagine the task and reimagine your temperament Got it. Okay, so so once I figure once I figure out those three things, that's step one. Where do we go from there? Step two is to make time for traction. Uh, so traction. So the opposite of of distraction is traction. And Mm -hmm. so what we want to do is to make more time in our day for the things we really want to do. And so here's the rule. The big insight here is that you have no right to call something a distraction unless you know what it distracted you from. So I talked to so many people in my interviews uh, that would say, oh my gosh, you know, the world is so distracting these days. I can't get anything done. My boss wants this. My kids want that. Did you hear what happened on Twitter yesterday? I can't get anything done. And then I said, you know, wow, that's, that's really tough. Can I see what it was you planned to do today? What did you want to do with your time exactly? Yeah. And they take out their calendar and it turns out that two thirds of Americans don't keep a calendar at all. It's like wow. playing a, putting a hundred dollar bill on the sidewalk in a busy city street. That hundred dollar bill is not going to be there unless you protect it, unless you watch it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and so that's exactly what we do with our time foolishly is that we don't plan it. Well, in this day and age with so many potential distractions, if you don't plan your day, somebody else will. Oh, and that's so, so funny. Yeah. Not only do we need to uh, plan our time and I mean down to the minute, we need to do what's called a time boxing 
uh, practice of not, you know, having an ideal template. And I'll give you a link to this sh- in the show notes where I, I built a tool to make this very, very easy to do. Take you about 30 minutes. This will change your life. Not only will it change your work life, right? When you have this schedule that you can see, okay, here's what my ideal work week looks like. Not only will it change your wor- work life, it'll also change your home life. Absolutely. Uh, I mean, I, I used to have so many fights with my wife about uh, domestic responsibilities. And, you know, there's a lot of data that shows that in heterosexual dual income households, mm-hmm. women still take on a disproportionate share yeah. of household admin. I hate to admit it. It's mm-hmm. true. And I was part of the problem. And yeah. I would always ask my wife, I would say, you know, honey, if, if I don't do something, just tell me and I'll do it. And, and what I didn't realize is that asking her to do that was actually a lot of work. Yeah, exactly. You're outsourcing <laughs> the actual responsibility exactly. of the deal for it. That's yeah. right. So that doesn't happen anymore. Why? Because today we have a time box schedule yeah. and every week, we actually just did it today, we sit down together and we do what's called a schedule sync. And that schedule sync has completely changed our life because now we know when everything is going to get done. And so all those contingencies like, oh, I got to prepare dinner for the week so that she can put it on the table when the, when, the, when the time comes or whatever it might be, is synchronized. The same goes at work. You know, so many managers, I don't know how this happens, but so yeah. many managers, we just lob work over to our employees. Okay, I want you to do this. I want you to do this. I want you to do that. That's all output. Okay, we add it to the backlog and we say, get all this stuff done. And we never consider the input. The input is time, mm-hmm. right? And so what we have to do is this weekly schedule sync. It only takes about 15 minutes where we align what needs to get done with the time we have to do it in. And it is an unbelievably helpful practice to, to have that very quick 15-minute check-in to do that quick schedule sync to help us prioritize with our with our colleagues, with our employees, what really needs to get done with that time in a given week. I like that. So I do I do this exercise with the with the leaders that I work with and particularly the leadership teams that I'm working with where I call it the defensible calendar. Like we, we figure out like what does your ideal work week look like and we kind of figure out the time boxes, the key time boxes and we do it as individuals and you know, and we talk about you know go out three months in your calendar because everything but the next three months is probably screwed anyway because you've got too many commitments and, and you put in those boxes and you say now your job is to protect these boxes with your life right? mm-hmm. and, and, mm-hmm. and you can do anything else outside these boxes and you can you know have little meetings and things like that but these are your core high productive Activity, high value hours. And then what we do is we do it as a team and mm-hmm. we look at everyone's schedules and we actually come up with for the leadership team, what are those time boxes? Because a lot of times what I find is that you get you get individuals that will do their time boxes. But if those time boxes aren't synced up across the leadership team at some yes. level, you will end up running, you know, they'll be in conflict. You'll get collisions between them because someone's trying to have focused time. Well, that's another person's meeting time. You know, so if you can actually get the leadership team and even to the company level, like if you can get companies to say, hey, like, you know what, Tuesday and and Thursday afternoons are focused time and we're not going to have any meetings and we're not going to do these other things. You know, everyone's, that's going to be when we all sit down and really get our, our valuable work done. Yeah. That, that's it, this organizational level stuff of that becomes really interesting and really important. Yeah. I mean, that the idea here isn't to focus on the tactics. I've seen a lot of companies get stuck when they say, oh, you know, we, we saw that our competitor was doing, you know, email free Fridays or no, no email Wednesdays or whatever the case might be. And it actually doesn't, doesn't work when you just copy the tactics. It's yeah. much more important to understand understand the strategy. So there's actually a, a whole section in the book. Half the book is about things that you can do as an individual. Mm-hmm. But let's get real here that, you know, the individual only has so much power yeah. that in an organization, if I teach you how to be indistractable, right, the four steps of mastering the internal triggers, make time for traction. The third step that we didn't cover yet is about uh, hacking back the external triggers. And the fourth step is about preventing distraction with pacts, which we can get to later. Yeah. If you do those four things and yet your boss calls you at 7 p.m. on a Friday night and says, hey, check your email because I need you to do something. It's not the email's fault. It's not the phone's fault, yeah. right? It's not the technology. It's your crappy boss. Yeah. And so we have to talk about company culture. And it turns out that distraction in the workplace is a symptom of cultural dysfunction. Yeah. And a lot of companies don't want to don't admit this fact. And by the way, this does. I'm not one of these people who says, oh, everybody should work a 40 hour week, right? In France, they make this law that you have. You can only work. <laughs> that's silly. I don't. I don't believe that. If you want to work 68 hours a week, do it. If that's consistent with your values, go for it. Nobody yeah. should tell you otherwise. You know, I've I've worked in a startup. That's what that's what it takes yeah. many times to yeah. work those many hours. And if you know what you're getting yourself into, do it. What I'm against is the bait and switch. Yeah. The bait and switch is when we get a job with an employer and the employer says, oh, yeah, yeah, this is a 40 hour work week. But then we realize, wait a minute. No, no, no that's 40 hours in the office. But 
all the uh, the real work gets done after work. Mm -hmm. And that's not what we bank for. The primary base level trust between the employee and the employer is I will give you my knowledge work and you will give me money for my time. But if that time bleeds into every area of our life, our health pays the price, our kids pay the price, yeah. our friends pay the price. We don't have time for anything else. Yeah. And that's not fair. Yeah. And so that's why this schedule syncing is, is so important. And understanding that we, in order to fight distraction in the workplace, we have to have a conversation, right? That what I, you know, it's, it's interesting. I, I um, heard from a lot of folks that I interviewed over the past five years writing this, this book, probably that you know, the number one most distracting technology was email. And number two, was some kind of group chat, whether it's Slack or, mm -hmm. or, or HipChat or some kind of other group chat app. People just think it's super distracting. So I went to pay Slack a visit and I went to company headquarters and I was amazed because you would think, look, if it's the technology that's doing it to us, right? The technology supposedly is distracting us and is addicting us, whatever. You would think that the company making the product, <laughs> exactly. right? They, they should be the most distracted people on earth yes, because nobody yeah. uses Slack more than Slack, yep. but that's not the case. When I went to Slack headquarters at six o'clock, everybody's gone. Yeah. Nobody's in the office. And in fact, if you use Slack on nights and weekends, you are reprimanded. Yeah. They don't do that there. And they don't do that there because they have the properties of a, of a healthy company culture. Yeah. And they have three properties. Number one, they give employees psychological safety, a place where people can raise their hands and say, hey, this isn't working out for me. Because the real problem with distraction is that people can't talk about their problems with distraction. That's the underlying trait yeah. that when we have a company with what's called the unmentionables, right? Yeah. Can't talk about that here yeah. because their people are scared that they're going to get fired. Yeah. That's where you have a company culture without psychological safety. So that's number one. Number two is you have to have a forum for people to talk about these problems. And then number three, you have to have a company culture where management exemplifies what it means to be indistractable. So culture flows downhill. And it, I was amazed when I walked into Slack company headquarters, I saw this sign written on the side of the wall. It literally says this on the wall in pink letters. It says, work hard and go home. Mm. They wrote it on the wall. I like it. Because it is part of company culture that this is what we do here. Yeah. And so what we don't want to do is just you know adopt somebody else's solution. What we want to do is come up with our own solution because the real problem is that people can't talk about their problems. <laughs> <laughs> That's the problem. It's like a you know a, an unhealthy family. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Where nobody can talk about the fact that that dad has a drinking problem. That's the real problem that we can't talk about the problem. Yeah. And it's the same thing that happens in, in an organization when people can't talk about their problems. That's where you get you know disasters like what happened recently at, at Boeing with the seven eighty seven Max yeah, and Enron's. People knew something was going on, but they couldn't talk about the problem because they were scared of getting fired. Yeah. So let's cover number three. Give me number three. Yeah. Oh yeah. So the third step is about hacking back external triggers. So external triggers, you know, these are the things that we typically think about, the pings, the dings, the rings, all of the things in our outside environment that can either lead us to traction or distraction. Mm -hmm. So this is where we hack back our email, where we hack back meetings, we hack back our phones, our desktops, group chat, all of these environments that we can do just a few things to make sure that these external triggers don't lead us astray. And, and, and you know, it's, it's not, this is probably the most tactical, practical part of the book, mm -hmm. but it, it, it is important. It's a third step. And there's one more step. The fourth step yep. is about preventing distraction with pacts. And so this is where we make some kind of pre-commitment. It's an ancient technique. It goes back 2,500 years yep. where we make some kind of contract with ourselves, with somebody else to make sure that we keep ourselves in. So in step three, we hack back those external triggers. We okay. keep the distractions out. Yep. In step four, we keep ourselves in. And so much of this, this technique is about using technology, ironically ironically enough, to keep out the technology that, or to uh, keep ourselves in, I should say, to prevent us from using the technologies that may otherwise distract us. So this so is where we example? use all kinds of tools. Sure. Yeah. So uh, a tool I use almost every day is called Forest. Okay. Forest is this great little app, super simple to use. Uh, and every time you want to do focused work, you open the app and you dial in how much time you want to do focused work for. Okay. So that's like, oh, people have seen that a million times, Pomodoro yeah. already, yeah. whatever. That's yeah. not what I'm talking about. The real key to this is that when you set how much time you want to do focused work for when you push go a little virtual tree is planted okay and if you pick up the phone and do anything with it the virtual tree dies <laughs> withers away oh my and gosh. you don't want to be a virtual tree murderer <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh so, i love it right so that little bit of a reminder to tell you nope you made a promise to yourself uh it keeps you out of the things you don't want to be doing 
that's what's called a pre-commitment. Now, this is what you want to do last, okay? A lot of people will jump to this first, and that's that's a big no-no because it can backfire. Yeah. So we want to make sure first we do we master the internal triggers, then we make time for traction, then we hack back the external triggers, and last, as a safety net, we're using these pre-commitments to make sure that we don't do something we don't want to do. I love it. Is there anything you found in terms of uh, kind of social things you can do? Like I used to do these um, like hackathon days where I would get together with other folks for a day of focused work, and, and the idea is you're you're all working on your own thing, but there's this, you know, kind of public accountability to, you know, are you still doing your thing and are you are you taking your sure. breaks when you take a break? What else have you seen that's that other than the technology stuff that will help you kind of stay within your agreement or stay within your focused work? Yeah, no, this is this is absolutely there's great techniques here. So, you know, what, what you're hinting at here is the loss of that social proof that we used to have, you know, yeah. our parents generation. If you walked into the office and you started reading Sports Illustrated or Vogue at your desk, you know, everybody would know that you're slacking off. (laughs) Well, today you could be on ESPN, but everybody thinks you're, you know, following up on sales leads on your computer or something. So that, that part of it is gone now. We don't have that kind of social proof, but the good news is we can bring it back. So we can find what I call a focus friend. We can just ask somebody oh from God. work, hey, you know, let's let's sit next to each other. I used to do this with a with a writing buddy. I still do this from time to time where we sit down together and we say, OK, you know, for two hours, we're going to do focus work. We'll take a break in the middle. Mm-hmm. And that that buddy, that that focus friend can keep you on task. I have to mention real quick a company I like so much I invested in. This is a company called Focusmate. Okay. And Focusmate is kind of like remember chat roulette back in the day. Oh yeah. So so chat roulette, you know, it's like that, but without all the nasty bits. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and the way it works, you log in, you book a time mm-hmm. when you want to do focused work for, and you're matched with somebody somewhere in the world that also wants to do focused work at that time. So this is great if you're the kind of person who has trouble getting started, mm-hmm. right? So you say, okay, I'm definitely going to work on that big project at 9 a.m., but then 9.15, 9.30 rolls along, 9.45, and you still haven't started. You're still checking email or whatever it might be. So if you don't show up at 9 a.m. when you said you would in this online forum, you're going to get a, a bad review. Yeah, you, and you don't think. want that. Yeah. And so that social pain, it's going to pr- be pain. <laughs> exactly, exactly. So that that social commitment of hey, if you don't show up, you know, Mir's going to be there and he's waiting for you gets you to, to to start and just having, you know, it's a little video screen where you see the the other person and seeing them working and you're working, it's amazing how impactful this can be in keeping you on task. Yeah, yeah, I love it. It's kind of using the whole kind of social pressure to uh to a benefit. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Oh. But again, we have to do this stuff last. Okay, if you jump if you jump the gun and do this before you do the other three first steps that we talked about, mastering the internal triggers, ex- other, it will fail. So this is only the last resort. Yeah, yeah. So, so where do people start? So give us give us a couple of good hints. If, if people want to start working on this, where would you begin? What what advice would you give them? What's kind of a way to get going on this? Yeah, so there's a great book called Indistractable, How to Control Your Attention and Choose Your Life, <laughs> which I recommend. And that's available wherever books are sold. I also have a, a website site at indistractable.com. We we had a, an 80 page quiz that or not a quiz, a workbook, I should call it, that helps you, you know, work through some of these techniques for yourself. I really didn't want it to be one of these books that, you know, you read and then you put back on the shelf. Yeah. It, I really wanted it to be practical. I really wanted to create an identity. So one of the things we didn't talk about uh, when it comes to these pre-commitments is the power of making what's called an identity pact. And this comes out of the research from religion. You know, this is not a book about willpower. I hate willpower. I hate yeah. self-control because I don't have it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and and it turns out nobody does. I mean, there's yeah. a whole debate in the philosophy and and uh, psychology community whether will uh, free will even exists. Yeah. And in many ways, it's 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 true. I mean, look, you know, if if the chocolate cake is on the fork on its way to your mouth and you're on a diet, it's too late. Yeah, You've already exactly. lost, right? Exactly. If, if the cigarette is lit and you're about to take a puff, it's too late, right? Yeah. If, if the cell phone is on your nightstand and you sleep with your phone every night, of course, the first thing you're going to do is check it in the morning. It, you know, they, they've got you. Yeah. And so here's the thing. We don't want to rely on on willpower. We don't want to rely on self-control. We want to rely on systems. Yeah. And that system, because here's the thing, if there's one message I want people to remember from my work, it's that the antidote to impulsiveness is forethought. Mm-hmm. We may or may not have free will. We don't know. What we do know is that we have free choice. Mm-hmm. There is nothing that these tech companies can throw at you that with a little bit of forethought, planning ahead, you can't do to defeat them. Mm-hmm. And so that's what we have to do. We have to decide today who we want to become tomorrow and take steps right now to make sure that we do what we say we're going to do in the future. 
Yeah. And it's, it's actually not that tough <laughs> yeah. once you know what you're doing. I mean, this completely changed my life. I've always struggled with self-control and self-discipline. I've never been all that good at it. And now over the past five years, I mean, I'm in the best shape of my life physically. I work out for the fr- I used to be clinically obese. I work out for the, consistently for the first time in my life. I spend more quality time with my daughter, with my wife, and I'm more productive at work than I've ever been. Yeah, I love it. It's like uh, the exercise of laying out your clothes for the next day as doing your future self a favor. Yeah. Uh, and just like if you take that approach and take that attitude and, you know, create the systems that are going to make it easier for your future self, then then you don't have to have the free will. You know, you don't That's have right. to spend all the, all the energy because it's just happening because of the system you put in place. Exactly. That, that relying on willpower and, and self-discipline and self-control, yeah. is very, very hard for most people. Yeah. Excellent. You know, this has been a pleasure. I'm going to make sure that the URLs and the book, information on the book are in the show notes so people can click through and get those. This has been a great conversation. Some really interesting ideas, I think really helpful for folks here that are looking to accomplish more, looking to grow their businesses, looking to create more value in their personal work and in their professional work. So this has been really helpful. I really appreciate the time. My pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. You've been listening to Scaling Up Services with business coach Bruce Eckfeldt. To find a full list of podcast episodes, download the tools and worksheets, and access other great content, visit the website at scalingupservices.com. And don't forget to sign up for the free newsletter at scalingupservices.com slash newsletter.